Uh, first of all, welcome to the SIAM uh, virtual uh, QA session. Um, so our speaker is from Canada. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Uh, Karai Karabina. Uh, let me just introduce him real quick. Um, he received his uh, PhD degree in, in combinatorics and optimization uh, from University of Waterloo. That's where we met uh, in the first place. So it's in Canada. So he currently works as a senior uh, research officer at the National Research uh, Council of Canada. And he's appointed as an adjunct associate professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, before Korai joined the National Research Council, he worked as an associate professor in the Department of uh, Mathematical Sciences at the Florida uh, Atlantic University. And his research focuses on the design, implementation, and cryptanalysis of cryptographic algorithms and uh, protocols. Let me just, uh, before we start, I'll just quickly go through our new uh, executive uh, board members. So Emma uh, took over the presidency. Uh, it's over there, I can see that she's uh, waving us. So <laughs> she's the new president. And we have Matthew, Kat, and Avery, and uh, Aiden, and Ahmed uh, as the new ads to our executive board. And quickly, I'm just going to advertise that student membership for SIAM is uh, free. Uh, please uh, go ahead and visit uh, the SIAM's uh, web page. And there's a lot of perks coming along with the membership. Please don't miss that. And if you just learn more about that, just send me an email. So it's, it's totally free to be a member of uh, SIAM. So at this moment, I'm going to pass the stage to Bruce. Bruce, the stage is yours. So. Hey, everybody. Uh, glad that everybody, this is a great, great crowd for a Friday afternoon, especially such a pretty Friday afternoon. So glad everybody's here and Greg, glad you're, you're joining us from uh, wherever you are. Thanks a bunch. All right, Corey, you can share your screen anytime you want and you can start anytime you want. Okay, so let me share the screen. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and I hope you will enjoy my presentation. I am planning to spend about 30 minutes with my slides. I'll give you a big picture of the field that I work in and present some highlights of my research and interests. Just to connect things better, I'll start my talk with my education background and work experience. I'll finish my presentation with some remarks that I hope will be useful for you. All right, let's start with my education. My education background follows a rather traditional pathway for my field. I studied pure math in my undergraduate years with more interest in algebra and number theory. Then, towards my master's and PhD, I started specializing in the field of cryptography, more specifically in elliptic curve cryptography. I would say that there were some courses that I took early in my studies which shaped my interest in research. We can discuss more about finding your own interests, but I think it is important to identify what you passionately like about your studies. Work experience. It is a very common question among students and even among professionals to ask, should I go to industry or should I stay in academia? This has been a question for me too. I can assure you that there is nothing to worry about asking these questions and to try different things. Of course, there are some differences but in the end, you will realize that there is not really a rigid boundary between them. I have about three years of experience in industry where I worked on the research and development of cryptographic algorithms and protocols. And then I worked in academia for about nine years. My main duties included conducting research, teaching courses, and supervising students. I also served in several committees and organized and participated in outreach events. More recently, I work as a senior research officer at the National Research Council Canada and as an adjunct associate professor at the University of Waterloo. Let's dig into some research now. Here I'll start with classical cryptography and shift the gear towards more modern approaches and applications. What is cryptography? Cryptography is the science of securing information and communication in the presence of attackers. In a typical setting, we have a client and a server, they are trying to exchange some information through an insecure channel. We call this an insecure channel because it is under full control of adversaries and attackers. It means that an attacker can read 
all the messages and their content exchanged in this channel, or they can even insert, delete or modify the messages and the packages. Therefore, in cryptography we try to achieve some fundamental goals. Four of those goals are confidentiality, message authentication, data integrity and non-repudiation. Confidentiality means that only authorized parties can access or see the data. Message authentication helps verifying the source of information. In data integrity, we try to ensure that data has not been altered or changed by unauthorized or by unknown means. In the worst case, if the data has ever been changed, we want to make sure that we are able to detect those changes. In non-repudiation, we try to prevent parties goals? from falsely denying their actions. For confidentiality, we use encryption algorithms. For message authentication and non-repudiation, we use signature schemes. For data integrity, we use message authentication codes. There are two main classes of encryption algorithms in cryptography. The first one is symmetric key and the second one is public key. Symmetric key encryption dates back to BC with a very well known algorithm called scissor cipher also known as the substitution cipher. More modern symmetric key encryption algorithms include data encryption standard and advanced encryption standard. The first step in symmetric key encryption is to generate and share a key. Generating a key is rather easy because it is boiling down to generating some random sequence of numbers. That's also called a cryptographic key. The hard part is to share the key between the parties in the protocol. Remember in our setting we had a client and a server. We have to make sure that before the protocol begins, those two parties have exactly the same copy of our cryptographic key. Well, this key is a secret key, so we have to make sure that nobody else has access to this key, therefore we have to assume that the key distribution is done through a secure channel, meaning that no adversary or attacker is assumed to exist. After those two parties receive their keys, they can now start exchanging messages. So if a client is trying to send a message to the server, she first gets the message and feeds this message together with the cryptographic key to the encryption algorithm that she has. Well, this gives a ciphertext and the ciphertext can be sent through the insecure channel now because even though an adversary captures the ciphertext, if, you are, if the encryption algorithm is secure enough, they cannot decipher it or they cannot read the messages. Well, once the server receives the ciphertext, it can feed the decryption algorithm that it has with the ciphertext and the key and recover the message as expected. A big challenge in symmetric key encryption is the key management. Recall that we assume each pair of users has to share a unique secret key in the protocol. Well, in a network with n users, this would mean that there are roughly n square mini keys in total and each user has to manage about n keys to connect to other users in the network. Well, in today's settings with millions of users distributed among the world, this assumption becomes quite impractical and very challenging. Well, luckily, public key cryptography comes to help here. In public key cryptography, we try to help the client and the server to exchange messages through an insecure channel. In a way, we do not want to assume anymore that the client and the server share a key through a secure channel, which is quite not practical in today's world. So we have a client, she's trying to send a message in a secure way through an insecure channel. How do we do this? Well, the setting is similar to symmetric key encryption, but also different. So we still have to generate a key, but instead of generating a single key, now the server generates a pair of keys. The first key is called the public key, and the second key is called the private key. 
The bank, the server, keeps the private key to itself, so it's a secret key, but the public key is going to be announced to the whole world. Well, before the announcement, the server finds a certificate authority and gets an approval on the public key. You can think of this also as a verification of the public key or a signature on the public key. Well, after the public key is verified by a certificate authority, the bank and the client can start the communication. Well, the first step is that the, the client receives a copy of the public key from the server. After checking the certificate on the public key, the client can put a message in a box and use the public key, which you can think of this as a lock, to lock the message and send it through the insecure channel to the server. Now remember, the server has a copy of the private key, and so the server can unlock the box and recover the message that the client sent. A very good thing about public key encryption is that it can be scaled to as many users as we like. This is because any user who wants to send an encrypted message to the server can use exactly the same copy of the public key of the server. This is not the case in symmetric key cryptography. Remember, for each pair of users who wants to interact, we need a unique key. Okay, the previous construction was very abstract. How do we really implement this in practice? RSA public key crypto system is one very concrete example of this. For the key generation, you need to find two large primes, P and Q, multiply them together and obtain another large number which we call N, also the public modulus. We compute another number, phi, as a product of P minus 1 and Q minus 1. Now you compute a number E such that the GCD of E and phi is equal to 1. The large number N and the little exponent E gives you the public key. To construct your private key, you have to find an integer D such that E times D is equal to 1 modulo phi. Now, the primes P and Q and the secret exponent D makes your private key. How do we encrypt? If we assume that our messages are integers from 1 to n, we determine the ciphertext C as m to the power e modulo n. Once we receive a ciphertext C, we decrypt this by computing C to the power d modulo n. One thing to really pay attention here is that encryption in blue text can be performed by anybody who knows the public key. But the decryption can only be done by the party who owns the private key, which is D. Signature generation and signature verification algorithms are similar. Signature generation looks more like the decryption algorithm and signature verification looks more like the encryption algorithm. What are the applications of public key cryptography? One application is secure internet communication. In our daily lives, we surf on the internet a lot and we enter some private information such as our usernames and passwords. We want to make sure that this information is communicated through a secure channel. If you pay attention to some of the web pages online and look at the top left corner of your browsers, you'll see a green lock. If you click on the green lock, you'll see a message, a tag, that the connection is secure. Now, if you further investigate this secure connection by clicking on it, you'll see a verification by some authority. This is the verification authority or the certificate authority from our previous slides as the sheriff office. So that's the office that gets the public keys certified. If you look into the certificate, 
you will indeed see that in many of the certificates, the public key algorithm is the RSA encryption algorithm. And if you further click on the public key of this algorithm, you'll see a large number, which in this example is a 2048-bit number, which is our public modulus, capital N, from our previous slides. Well, we say RSA is secure, but why is it secure? Well, one of the things an adversary can try to attack an RSA crypto system is to get the public key N and try to factor this number into a product of two large primes, P and Q. In a classical setting, this is an intractable problem and it takes several core years that we do not really have to worry too much about it. What are some other applications of public key cryptography? We have already discussed about public key encryption and digital signatures. Well, some other interesting applications are including digital cash, electronic money, nowadays very popular Bitcoin and blockchain applications. We have a very interesting field called identity-based cryptography and also in secure cloud computing and storage we rely a lot on public key cryptographic schemes. Post-quantum cryptography We noted that RSA is secure in the classical setting. This would mean that the adversary with a classical computer has hard time factoring the modulus n as a product of two large primes p and q. This takes quite a good number of years and we do not really have to worry too much about it. This is not the case in the post-quantum setting. Once an adversary can utilize a large-scale quantum computing, then she can easily factor the public modulus n as p times q. To be more concrete, Peter Shore in 1994 showed that integer factorization problem can be solved in polynomial time by using quantum computers. This would mean that currently deployed public key crypto systems are not secure against attacks powered by quantum computers. In post-quantum cryptography, we refer to public key crypto systems which are believed to be secure against classical and quantum attacks. Some of the examples of post-quantum cryptographic algorithms are code-based algorithms, hash-based, isogeny-based, lattice-based algorithms, and multivariate crypto systems. I will not go into too much details of post-quantum cryptographic algorithms, but for those who are interested, I would strongly recommend to visit the NIST PQC standardization webpage. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology has initiated a process to evaluate and standardize quantum-resistant public key cryptographic algorithms. The call came out in 2016 with several proposals submitted in 2017. The idea is to have the draft standards available by 2024. Now, I would like to discuss some algorithms that we use in public key cryptography. Remember, in RSA in decryption, we receive a ciphertext C and we raise the ciphertext to the power D modulo a number n. Here D is our private exponent and n is the public modulus. This is rather a simple operation, mathematically, because it involves D minus 1 modular multiplications. Similar operations are performed in other public key crypto systems. One example is elliptic curve cryptography. In short, I can define a curve and I can define an addition operation over the set of points on this curve. If you look at the picture here, you can take two points P and Q on the curve and compute the addition of those two points P and Q as R prime in the picture. Similarly, given a point Q, you can add this point to itself and receive two times Q as output. Or given a point P, we can find a point Q such that P plus Q is equal to the identity element. This 
these operations are mathematically simple, but we have to note that when computing those operations, we deal with very large numbers. So in the case of the elliptic curve group, when we compute a times p in a typical protocol, our scalar a, our integer a, is a large number, which has about 77 digits in it. Well, using the naive method of adding p to itself, would it be really practical in a crypto system? Because even though your computer can perform maybe 100 billion operations per second, then you would have to wait about 10 to the power 66 seconds. Instead, we try to invent more efficient algorithms. The next algorithm that we will discuss is going to use the binary representation of integers. Just a quick example that the binary representation of 37 would be 100101. And the algorithms that follow is going to perform one or two operations for each bit in its representation. Well, now, if you now revisit the scalar A, which has about 77 digits or 256 bits in it, using our efficient algorithms, you'll just be able to compute those operations A times P in about 500 steps. The first algorithm we discuss is the double ended algorithm. In the double ended algorithm, we trace the binary representation of the given scalar A. In our example, our scalar is 37 and the binary representation of this 37 is 100101. This algorithm starts with the point P and then it always looks at the next bit in the representation. If the next bit is 0, we simply double the point. Well, in the beginning we start with P and in this example our next bit is 0, so we just update the point P to 2P. Well, the next bit is also 0 in the blue box and our point at that state is 2P, so we just double the point from 2P to 4P. In the algorithm, if the next bit is 1, then we perform a different operation. Instead of just doubling the point, we first double the point and then we add our base point P. So 4P in this example is doubled to 8P and then we add the point P and we obtain 9P. Well, the next bit is 0, which is in the blue box, which means we simply double the point 9P to 18P. The last bit is 1, which would mean that we first double the current point, we obtain 36p from 18p, but now we have to add the base point p, and we output 37 times p as required. This is known as the double and add algorithm. Now let's analyze the power consumption of your device while performing this algorithm, or computing 37 times p. Remember, each time we see the next bit as 0, we simply double the point. And each time we see the next bit is as 1, we double and add. This would mean that the operations shown in blue in this slide are going to consume less power than the operations that are shown in red, simply because there is an extra addition operation in the game. So simply to show this in a graph of power versus the bits in your scalar, you would observe less consumption whenever your bit is zero and observe higher consumption, power consumption, when the bit in your scalar is one. Well, is this now good or bad from cryptographic point of view? This is very dangerous from a user's perspective because if an adversary, not knowing your secret key, can observe the power consumption of your device, he or she can easily guess the bits in your integer. Simply put, if the power consumption is less at certain stages in your computation, then the adversary can identify those bits as zero, and if the power consumption is higher at certain stages in your computation, 
then the adversary can identify those bits as 1. This means that even though the double and add algorithm is efficient for our purposes, it is not secure to implement. The next algorithm we discuss does a better job than the double and add algorithm and makes the adversary's life a bit more difficult. The name of this algorithm is Montgomery Ladder. The problem with the previous algorithm was that the operations highly depend on the bits in the sequence. Remember, if the next bit is 0, we always performed the double operation, and if the next bit is 1, we always perform the double and add operation. In Montgomery letter, we still use the binary representation of integers but perform a regular sequence of operations. To be more concrete, we keep track of two points at a time and we always perform double and add operations in the sequence. So if the next bit is 0, we are going to update the top point t to 2 times t and the bottom points b to t plus b. If the next bit is 1, we update the bottom point to 2 times b and the top point to t plus b. To see this in an example, we still go through the same example of performing 37 times p. If you now observe, the operations in this algorithm it follows rather regular sequence of operations double and add, double and add, double and add independent of the bit in your integer. In other words, if an adversary was to observe the power consumption in your device while performing those operations, they would witness rather a uniform power consumption in your device, which makes their life to guess the bits in your integer to be more difficult. I think the examples that we've just went over shows that cryptography is really a creative land of ideas from mathematics, computer science and engineering. We have to be very careful in the design, development, cryptanalysis and implementation of protocols. We have to make sure that we run a theoretical and rigorous analysis of our algorithms and their implementation. We try to make those implementations practical in both software and hardware. And always we have to find a good balance in the security, efficiency and usability of those algorithms and protocols. All right, in the last part of my talk, I would like to make some remarks, which I hope will be useful to you to determine your future career and education goals. I have four categories, explore, strategize, adventure, and enjoy. It is very important to have a very good understanding of your interests and passion. I strongly suggest to try different courses in different fields, including mathematics, computer science, and engineering. They all come in different flavors with different levels of challenges. Try to attend as many seminars and talks as possible. They could be some events in your department or colloquium talks. Try to make use of all the resources you have around. Follow the trends in your fields. Read some biographies. Read some success stories, but also read some failure stories. Talk to your peers, professors, friends and family. Strategize. You have your likes, you have your needs, but beware of the competition. You have to stand out from the crowd, you have to be professional, and you should get recognized. You should take several courses, of course, but try to be involved in term projects and go after some certificates in your field. Get some non-trivial experience. Teaching and research assistance is great to have, but try to be involved in more depth in your field. Try to get some internships. Try to write papers, maybe present your work at a conference, and if you wrote a software, try to make this available in GitHub. You would like to have very strong references in your packages. There is a difference between 
somebody writing you that you're a great student, you took several courses with all A's, versus that somebody supervised you in a research project where you sold a challenge and presented your work at a conference and published it at a journal. Adventure. Well, we all like to converge to an ultimate happy state. I think this is very challenging, but I can assure you that the whole experience has a lot of fun in it. Well, one good news is that I can assure you that one day, with very good probability, you'll have a job. Well, having a job is merely the beginning of the adventure. You may have a job, but you may have other things that you're not so happy with it. Again, the good news is that I can assure you that with very good probability you will like your job. Well, of course, you may not like your job, but liking your job or not liking it may or may not be good for you. So what I'm trying to say is that you don't really have to worry too much about it. You may like your job, but it may not be paying you enough. You may like your job, but maybe you don't like your boss. Or maybe you don't really like where you live. On the other side, you may not like your job, but maybe it's paying you really well. Or maybe you just started and you really need this job. Enjoy. Well, you all know that career is a big part of your life. But please do not ignore the rest. I would suggest to play safe, but also enjoy your life as a whole. Try to find your interests, try to find your passion and follow them. For your careers and professional lives, try to gain transferable skills and do transfer them. Because if you do not use them, you are going to lose them. Try to stay interdisciplinary but do at least one thing really good, that you are the to-go person for this. Okay, this concludes my talk, and I'll just present one more slide, where you could find my email, my LinkedIn profile, and my scholarly work. Please do not hesitate to contact me and reach out to me by email, and I'll be happy to respond to any of your questions. Thank you. All right, Emma is the boss, so Emma is going to take over the stage and, and I accept the questions. So, Emma, go for it. Thank you. Still having trouble with the unmuting, but um, thank you very much. That was a really excellent presentation. Um, I, I guess first, but, um, I want to open the floor to anyone in the, you know, anyone in the audience um, who has a question because we do have a list of questions that other SIAM members who couldn't be here sent in, but I, you know, I want to prioritize it, the people who are here watching live. So if anyone has any questions, um, if you can't unmute yourself, just send a message in the uh, in the chat and Dr. Ozer will take care of that. Okay, cool. Um, I noticed that you mentioned AES uh, once there in one of the early on slides. And uh, forgive me if you mentioned some uses of that when, when the, the audio was a little uh, suspect, but I, I was wondering where maybe that's applied, if that's applied in like SSH or anything, or if RSA is still more widely used than, than AES is? Yeah, um, so that's a very good question. So AES is faster and secure, but it's a symmetric cryptographic algorithm. So the difficult part is about AES. Right? So if you and I share a key, like in the very uh, beginning, like in, in my talk, I gave an example, right? As long as you can share this key among two parties, then we are free to use AES. It's a secure algorithm. But the problem is we have this key shared among parties. So in practical applications, what happens is that you use a public key encryption algorithm to transfer this key. So that's what the handshake uh, protocols that you may be reading like uh, online. Uh, you just use the public key encryption most of the time in practice in the beginning of your communication. You transfer this key. That's why I picked this uh, example where the, in the public key encryption algorithm, the label user is uh, putting a key in a box and sending it through, right? Mm -hmm. So this a handshake, like one, uh, one, one way handshake, I would say. Uh, so I'm sending you a key and I copy that key. And then once you have this key securely, we use this key with AES. 
So that's how it goes in practice. So you don't want to public key encryption all the way, but you do it in the beginning because it's more expensive. And then you share a key and then you start using a symmetric key encryption algorithm like AES or DES3. Very cool. Okay. Have one question from our um, pool that really interests me. What would you say um, everyday people need to understand about cr um, cryptography and data security? So what, uh, just to give it clear, what would I say to an uh, everyday person just to pick cryptography? Person? Yeah, what, what would you say the most important thing for, I guess, the general public to understand about cryptography is? Um, I would really say, um, like, to keep your data confidential and secure is the big part. Um, even though, like, nowadays, with the social, I would, if, if I were to make a pitch, I would rather use, like, social media. Because everybody knows, like, uh, information is everywhere and it's used to. I would probably say that, you know, own your data. And if you're using it, make sure that you are the only one who is in the control for data. Um, you know, I, that's more on the privacy side, I would say. But um, that's that's what I would try. And, you know. If, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is there any real fear from people like you that do cryptography every day that like quantum computing is going to render some of your guys' practices like not feasible anymore or not secure, I guess you would say? Like, you know, like factoring of large numbers into two primes. So that's the reality that quantum computers can factor integers in programmable time, which means that I say cryptography with, a, with the existence of a quantum computer that can run as terrorized will break our crypto systems right now. So all the online communication is not secure in the presence of um, large scale quantum computers. So they're not in practice yet, but they're working on it. So that's why though, like we don't wait until the time that they're built in practice, right? So we do have quantum computers, but they cannot factor large numbers yet just because of the physical limitations. But they'll be there at some point, everybody believes so. That's why like we are proactive in cryptography, that we are trying to now replace those algorithms by another set of algorithms, which are going to be secure against quantum computers. So hopefully by the time, that's why like, I show you this like NIST standardization effort, hopefully by 2024, we'll have agreed on a set of algorithms where we are happy to replace before it's too late. Right, so that's you know that's good news for science. It's bad news for communication, but you know uh, I think we'll be in good shape. I'm not worried too much about it. Uh, I think we'll be in time replacing those current algorithms with the quantum secure ones. Uh, so I'm I'm curious because um, all of these things assume that the other party uh, the other party gets the message right and so i think that like this may be called like the two generals problem or something um where you're not sure that someone else got your message so is there is that a big consideration in this sort of thing like worrying about if someone else gets the message and is there also like error correction built into some of these algorithms um like hamming codes are like real basic example of what i might mean um so if I understand the question correctly, so we don't really worry too much about like somebody stealing a package, right? So consider the ciphertext. I'm not sure if you still see my screen. Yep. But if you look at the ciphertext as a client, I don't really worry too much about somebody stealing this, right? Because I know that if you steal it, you won't be able to read the message inside. So maybe a package is lost. Of course, you can cut the line or maybe drop the packages, but then I can resend them. So the server would know me like, look, like I didn't get the package from you, resend it. So I'm not really worried too much about it. That's why we have this insecure channel that, you know, as long as you do the uh, uh, encryption correctly, you don't worry too much about the rest. Right. Okay, but like something you mentioned about error correction codes, like is somebody changing the package? That's a big concern, right? So if the client is sending a cipher text, and I cut in the middle and I replace the ciphertext with mine, that's a big problem, right? So that's why this picture is not complete. When we send our ciphertext, I also attach some signatures of us. Right? So, uh, you know, then in general in practice, client is sending a message, a ciphertext, 
you also send some sort of a, either a message authentication code or a signature associated with it so that the server once receives a cipher text can verify it is indeed coming from the intended uh, client. So that's exactly the, um, those fundamental goals that I'll skip. Like this is the uh, message authentication, right? So you can, there are other tools that you can authenticate the messages that you make sure that it's coming from the party that you think it's coming from. And the, the, the signature is encrypted too, so it can't be like replicated by that. Signatures, party, are, right? signatures are public, but then they cannot be replicated. Uh, once you sign it, you are the only one who can sign it. Being uh, private in general, there are scenarios where you want to encrypt your signatures too, but in general, the signatures, like which is blue here, it goes uh, uh, because they're publicly verifiable. You don't really need to encrypt them further unless there's another application. Uh, I have a final question though before we move on. Um, Corey, can you tell us? Uh, what was the what was the driving point that you switched back from academia to? I mean, you're still associated with University of Waterloo, uh, right? I, just correct me if I'm wrong. That was in your bio, but now you're working for the government. So how 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 did that transition happen? Um, so that's a good question. The answer is not short, uh, but uh, you know, it's it's really the life more or less, and then. Uh, you know, you try to balance things that uh, you work, you have work, and then you want to balance the place that you want to live in. And then, you know, as you extend the picture to, you know, probably not getting the picture for many of the uh, students yet, but that's not like a single person thing, right? So you try to really balance everything like for yourself, for your family, and for the things that you plan in the future, and also position wise too. So what I see is that like after a few years, everybody looks for a maybe better opportunity, looks for a, another opportunity, a different one. So that's really not a, like one correct answer. And, um, you know, I think one thing that we should really keep constant for ourselves is make sure that like whatever we do is like we do it happily. And then like we get some satisfaction out of it and then we really contribute to it. So that's, you know, again, like this probably not in a few minutes, but, you know, if other people are interested, I can tell more about because I see um, some jobs in my career, some of them are expected, some of them were not so expected. Um, so that's not, not one answer, but you know, uh, as long as that's why like I said, like do something passionately and then, you know, you'll be happy in the end. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any final questions? Any final questions here? So if, if our students want to contact you, what email should we provide them? So uh, what I'll do is I'll, so the contact information over here, which I posted in the end of the slides. Um, maybe if I can find it. Uh, my Gmail is the best, like I have the most access to it. As I said, I have like four email addresses already in my list. So I didn't know which one should I. Well, confusion. So the one that's in the uh, QR code in this like, slide is, is the correct one. Uh, but again, like, um, uh, use my uh, last Gmail address that I can do, or I can send you an email too, like those uh, information, like my slide or my LinkedIn profile, any platform, uh, feel free. Um, so I'll, I'll be happy to answer if you know, any question by email or anything to chat, like, I'm happy to chat. Emma, do you have any other words to add? No, no. All right. Well, thank you very much, Korai, for joining us. Um, uh, if, if it wasn't virtual, by the way, there's no way we could invite you from Canada and uh, pay your trip and everything. So this is the only way. Uh, thanks a lot. I mean, that, that, was very, uh, that was a very good talk. Uh, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. We had a little bit of like technical issues in the beginning, but I think uh, we survived through that. Um, well, uh, I think we're going to close the session again. I, I thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I'm really glad to be here. And again, feel free to uh, contact me for any reason. I'll be happy to um, respond. Awesome. Thanks all for coming. So I, I think we're going to close the session. Uh, you can leave anytime. All right. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good weekend. Yeah, you too. <laughs>